The Impromptu of Versailles by Moliere, translated by Henry Van Lund. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Moliere, a ridiculous marquis, read by Thomas Copeland. Bricot, a man of quality. Read by Thomas Peter. La Grange, a ridiculous marquis. Read by Nemo. Du Quasi, a poet. Read by Alan Mapstone. La Thorillière, a fidgety marquis. Read by Chuck Williamson. Bejat and the Busybodies. Read by Todd. Mademoiselle du Parc, a ceremonious marchioness, read by Sonia. Mademoiselle Beja, a prude, read by Beth Thomas. Mademoiselle de Brie, a sage coquette, read by Eva Davis. Mademoiselle Molière, a satirical wit, read by Sandra. Mademoiselle du Croisy, a whining plague, read by Avaï. Mademoiselle Hervé, a conceited chambermaid, read by Lian Yao. Narrator, read by James Curran. Scene, Versailles, in the King's Antechamber. Scene 1. Moliere, Bricot, Lagrange, Du Cosset, Mademoiselle Dupoc, Mademoiselle Bejotte, Mademoiselle Dubré, Mademoiselle Boliere, Mademoiselle Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. Moliere, alone, speaking to his fellow actors behind the scenes. Come, ladies and gentlemen, is this delay meant for a joke? Are you never coming here? Plague take the people. I say, break all. Behind. What? Lagrange? Behind. What is it? You cross ye. Behind. Who calls? Mademoiselle Dupar Behind. Well? Mademoiselle Béjar? Behind. What is the matter? Mademoiselle de Brie? Behind. What do you want? Mademoiselle du Crozy? Behind. Whatever is it? Mademoiselle Hervé? Behind. I am coming! I think I shall go mad with these people. Listen to me. Enter Brakehort, Lagrange, Du Crosset. Deuce take me, gentlemen. Will you drive me out of my wits today? What would you have us do? We do not know our parts, and you will drive us out of our wits if you force us to play in this style. Oh, what an awkward team to drive our actors. Enter Mademoiselles Bejotte, Du Proc, Du Bray, Moliere, Du Crosset and Hervé. Well, here we are. What do you mean to do? What is your idea? What is to be done? Pray, let us take our positions. And since we are ready dressed and the king will not come for a couple of hours, let us employ the time in rehearsing our piece and see how we are to play our parts. How are we to play what we do not know? As for me, I declare that I do not remember a word of my part. I am sure I shall have to be prompted from beginning to end. And I just mean to hold mine in my hand. So do I. For my part, I have not much to say. Nor I either. But for all that, I would not promise not to make a slip. I would give ten pistoles to be out of it. I would stand a score of good blows with a whip to be the same, I assure you. You are all just disgusted at having parts that do not please you. What would you do if you were in my place, I should like to know? Who? You? You are not to be pitied. For having written the piece, you need not be afraid of tripping. And have I nothing to fear but want of memory? Do you reckon the anxiety as to our success, which is entirely my own concern, nothing? And do you think it a trifle to provide something comic, for such an assembly as this, 
to undertake to excite laughter in those who command our respect and who only laugh when they choose must not any author tremble when he comes to such a test would it not be natural for me to say that i would give everything in the world to be quit of it if that makes you tremble you should have been more careful and not have undertaken what you have done in eight days how could i refuse the command of a king how by a respectful excuse based on the impossibility of the thing in the short time that was allowed you any one else in your place would have thought more of his reputation and would have taken care not to expose himself as you are doing what will you do pray if the thing fails think what advantage all your enemies will take of it ay to be sure you ought to have respectfully excused yourself to the king or required more time oh mademoiselle kings like nothing better than a ready obedience and are not at all pleased to meet with obstacles things are not acceptable save at the moment when they desire them to try to delay their amusement is to take away all the charm they want pleasures that do not keep them waiting and those that are least prepared are always the most agreeable to them we ought never to think of ourselves in what they desire of us our only business is to please them and when they command us it is our part to respond quickly to their wish we had better do amiss what they require of us than not do it soon enough if we have the shame of not succeeding we always have the credit of having speedily obeyed their commands but now pray let us set about a rehearsal what would you have us do if we do not know our parts i tell you you shall know them even if you do not quite know them can you not fill in out of your own heads as it is in prose and you know your subject thank you for nothing prose is worse than verse shall i tell you what it is you ought to write a comedy in which you could act all alone be quiet wife what a dunce you are thanks dear husband that just shows how strangely marriage alters people you would not have said that to me eighteen months ago pray be quiet it is an odd thing that a trifling ceremony deprives us of all our good qualities and that a husband and a lover regard the same woman with such different eyes here is a sermon upon my word if i were to write a comedy that should be my subject i would justify women in many things of which they are accused and i would make husbands afraid of the contrast between their abrupt manners and the civility of lovers well let it pass we cannot chatter now we have something else to do but since you were ordered to work on the subject of the criticism that is passed on you why not write that comedy of actors that you have talked about so long it was a ready-made notion and would have come quite pat the more so as having undertaken to delineate you they gave you an opportunity to delineate them it might have been called their portrait far more justly than all their productions can be called yours for to try to mimic a comedian in a comic part is not to describe himself but only after him the characters he represents and making use of the same touches and the same hues which he is obliged to employ in the various ridiculous characters that he draws from nature but to mimic an actor in serious parts is to describe him by faults which are entirely his own since characters of this kind do not carry either the gestures or ridiculous tones by which the actor is recognized it is true but i have my reasons for not doing it between ourselves i did not think it would be worth the trouble and besides i should want more time to work out the idea as their days for acting are the same as our own i have hardly seen them three or four times since we have been in paris i have caught nothing of their style of delivery but what was at once apparent to the eye i should have to study them more to make my portraits very like them i must say i have recognized some of them in your imitations i never heard this talked of i had the idea once in my head but i dismissed it as a trifle a jest which might have raised a laugh give me a specimen as you have given it to others we have no time now just a word or two i thought of a comedy in which there should have been a poet whose part i would have taken myself coming to offer a piece to a strolling company fresh from the provinces have you actors and actresses he was to say 
capable of doing justice to a play? For my play is a play... Oh, sir, the comedians were to answer, we have ladies and gentlemen who have passed muster wherever they have been. And who plays the kings amongst you? There is an actor who sometimes undertakes it. Who? A well-made young man? Surely you jest. You want a king who is very fat and as big as four men, a king by Jove well stuffed out, a king of vast circumference, who could fill a throne handsomely. Only fancy a well-made king. There is one great fault to begin with. But let me hear him recite a dozen lines. Then the actor should repeat, for example, some lines of the king in Nicomed. I say, Erasmus, he has too well served me, has raised my power, and so on, in the most natural manner he could. Then the poet. What? You call that reciting? You are joking. You should say things with an emphasis. Listen to me. He imitates Montfleury, a comedian of the Hotel de Bourgogne. I say, Araspus, he has too well served me, has raised my power. You see this attitude? Observe that well. There lay the proper stress on the last line. That is what elicits approbation and makes the public applaud you. But, sir, the actor was to answer, bethinks a king who is conversing alone with the captain of his guards, talks a little more mildly, and hardly uses this demoniacal tone. You do not understand it. Go and speak in your way, and see if you get an atom of applause. Ah, let us hear a scene between a lover and his mistress, on which an actor and actress should have played a scene together, that of Camilla and Curiatius. Dost go, dear soul, and does this fatal honour so charm thee at the cost of all our bliss? Ah, now too well I see, etc., like the other, as naturally as they could. And the poet would break out, You're joking! That is good for nothing. This is how you ought to recite it. Imitating Mademoiselle de Beauchateau, an actress of the Hotel de Bourgogne. Dost go, dear soul, etc. Nay, but I know thee better, etc. See how natural and impassioned this is. Admire the smiling face she maintains in the deepest affliction. There, that was my idea, and my poet should have run through all the actors in the same manner. I like the notion, and I recognize some of them by the very first lines. Do you go on. Moyer, imitating Beauchateau, in some lines from Cid. Pierced to the centre of my heart, etc. And do you know this man in Sertorius's Pompey? Imitating Hot Roche, a comedian of the Hotel de Bourgogne. The enmity which either faction sways engenders here no honour, etc. I think I know him a little. And this one? Imitating de Villers, another comedian of the Hotel de Bourgogne. My lord, Polybius is dead, etc. Yes, I know who he is. But I fancy there are some amongst them whom you would find it hard to mimic. Good heavens, there is not one that cannot be had somewhere if I had studied them well. But you make me lose precious time. Pray, let us think of ourselves and not amuse ourselves any longer with talking. To Lagrange. Take care how you act the part of the Marquis with me. Marquis again? Yes, Marquis again. What the deuce would you have me hit on for a character acceptable to the audience? The Marquis, in these days, is the funny character in a comedy. And as in all the old comedies, there was always a clownish servant to make the spectators laugh, so now in all our pieces... There must always be a ridiculous marquis to divert the company. It is true. That cannot be left out. As to you, mademoiselle? Nay, as to me, I shall act wretchedly. I do not know why you have given me this ceremonious part. Good heavens, mademoiselle, 
That is what you said when you had your part in the school for wives, criticized. Yet you acquitted yourself admirably, and everyone agreed that it could not be better done. Believe me, this will be the same. You will play it better than you think. How can that be? There is no one in the world less ceremonious than I. True, and that is how you prove yourself to be an excellent actress, representing well a character which is opposed to your mood. Try then, all of you, to catch the spirit of your parts aright, and to imagine that you are what you represent. To de Crossy. You play a poet, and you ought to be taken up with your part to mark the pedantic air which is maintained amidst the converse of the fashionable world. That sententious voice and precision of pronunciation, dwelling on every syllable, and not letting a letter drop from the strictest spelling. To break what? As for you, you play a courtier, as you have already done in the School for Wives Criticized. That is, you must assume a sedate air and a natural tone of voice, and gesticulate as little as possible. To Lagrange. As for you, I have nothing to say to you. To Mademoiselle Bejotte. You represent one of those women who, provided they are not making love, think everything else is permitted to them, who are always proudly entrenched in their prudery, looking up and down on every one, holding all the good qualities that others possess as nothing in comparison with a miserable honour which no one cares about. Keep this character always before your eyes, that you may show all its tricks. To Mademoiselle Debris. As for you, you play one of those women who think they are the most virtuous persons in the world, so long as they save appearances, who believe that the sin lies only in the scandal who would quietly carry on their intrigues in the style of an honourable attachment, and call those friends whom others call lovers. To Mademoiselle Moliere. You play the same character as in the School for Wives criticised, and I have nothing more to say to you than to Mademoiselle Dupart. To Mademoiselle de Crossy. As for you, you represent one of those people who are sweetly charitable to everyone who always give a passing sting with their tongues, and who would be very sorry if they let their neighbours be well spoken of. I believe you will not acquit yourself badly in this part. To Mademoiselle Hervé. For you? You are the maid of the précieuse who is always putting her spoke into the conversation and picks up all her mistress' expressions as well as she can. I tell you all your characters that you may impress them strongly on your minds. Let us now begin to rehearse, and see how it will do. Oh, here comes a bore. This is all we wanted. Scene two. La Thorière, Molière, Brecourt, Lagrange, de Crossy, Mademoiselle du Parc, Mademoiselle Bejotet, Mademoiselle de Brie, Mademoiselle Molière, Mademoiselle de Crossy, Mademoiselle Hervé. La Thorière. Good day, Moliere. Sir, your servant. Plague take the man. How goes it? Very well. What can I do for you? To the actresses. Ladies, do not... I come from a place where I have been praising you up. I am obliged to you. The devil take you. To the actors. Pray take care. You play a new piece tonight. Yes, sir. To the actresses. Do not forget. The king got you to do it? Yes, sir. To the actors. Pray, remember. What do you call it? Yes, sir. I ask what you call it. Oh, upon my word, I do not know. To the actresses. You must, if you please. How are you going to be dressed? As you see. To the actors. I beg you. When do you begin? When the king comes. The deuce take him at his questions. When do you think he will come? May the Quincy choke me if I know, sir. Do you not know? Look here, sir. I am the most ignorant man in the world. I swear I know nothing of anything about what you ask. I am going mad. 
this wretch comes cross-examining me in his cool way, never dreaming that I may have other things to attend to. Ladies, your servant. Ah, good. Now he is on the other side. La Thoriere, to Mademoiselle du Crosset. You are as handsome as a little angel. Do you both play today? Looking at Mademoiselle Heve. Yes, sir. <laughs> Without you, uh, the comedy would not be worth much. Moyer, whispering to the actresses. Can you not send that man about his business? Sir, we have a rehearsal on. Oh, Zunes, I shall not prevent you. You have only to go on. But... <laughs> nay, nay, I, I should be sorry to trouble anyone. Do what you have to do without scruple. Yes, but... I assure you I am a man of no ceremony, and you can rehearse what you like. Sir, these ladies hesitate to tell you that they would much prefer that no one should be present during this rehearsal. Uh, but why? You have nothing to fear from me. Sir, it is their custom. You will be the better pleased when the thing takes you by surprise. Oh, then I shall go, and tell them you are ready. By no means, sir. Do not be in a hurry, pray. Scene three. Moyer, Bricotte, Lagrange, Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Du Parc, Mademoiselle Béjar, Mademoiselle Dubry, Mademoiselle Molière, Mademoiselle Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. Oh, dear, this world is full of impertinent people. But now... Come, let us begin. In the first place, then, imagine that the scene is in the king's antechamber, for it is a place where plenty of amusing things go on every day. It is easy to introduce there whomsoever we please, and reasons can even be found to explain the appearance of the ladies whom I bring in. The comedy opens with the meeting of two marquises. To Lagrange. Be sure and do not forget to come from that side, as I told you, with what they call a distinguished air, a combing your wig, and humming a tune between your teeth. La, 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 la. And just move aside, the rest of you, for a couple of marquises require room, and they are not the sort of persons to be satisfied with a small space. To Lagrange. Now then, speak. Good day, Marquis. Oh, dear, that is not the way in which Marquis talk. It must be a little higher. Most of these gentlemen affect a special tone to distinguish themselves from the vulgar. Good day, Marquis. Try again. Good day, Marquis. Ah, oh, Marquis, you are most obedient. What are you doing there? Steth, you may see. I am waiting until all these persons have cleared away from the door, that I may show my face there. Zounds! What a crowd! I do not care to go and push myself through. I had rather wait till the last. There is a score there who have no chance of getting in, but they take good care to press forward and occupy all the approaches to the door. Let us call out our names to the doorkeeper, so that he may summon us. That may do for you, but I do not wish Moliere to take me off. Yet I think, Marquis, that it is you he takes off in the school for wives criticized. Me? Most mighty potentate, it is your very self. Ah, upon my word. You are kind to fit me with your own character. Death, you are amusing to give me what belongs to yourself. <laughs> oh, how entertaining. Ah, how comical. What? You mean to maintain that it is not you who are exhibited in the Marquis of the School for Wives Criticized? Just so. It is I. Detestable, egad, detestable, cream-tart. Oh, it is I, it is I, assuredly it is I. 
Yes, it is you. You need not jest, and we shall lay a wager if you like, and see which of us is right. Well, then, what will you bet? I bet a hundred pistoles that it is you. And I bet a hundred it is you. Money down. Money down. Ninety on a mint ass and ten cash. Content. Done, then. Your money runs a great risk. Yours is in danger. Who shall be umpire? Here is a gentleman who shall decide. Chevalier? What is it? A good. Here is the other who assumes the tone of a marquis. Did I not tell you that you were playing a part in which you had to speak naturally? Uh, so you did. Now then. Chevalier! What is it? Just decide betwixt us on a wager we have made. What wager? We cannot agree who is the Marquis in Moliere's school for wives criticised. He bets that it is I, and I bet that it is he. Well, I decide that it is neither the one nor the other. You are fools, both of you, to wish that these caps should fit. This is just what I heard Moliere complaining of the other day, when he was talking to some people who charged him with the same thing. He said that nothing annoyed him so much as to be accused of inadvertent upon any one in the portraits he drew, and that his design is to paint manners without striking at individuals, and that all the characters whom he introduces are imaginary, phantoms, so to speak, which he clothes according to his fancy in order to please his audience that he would be much vexed to have hit any one through them, and that if aught could sicken him of writing comedies, it would be the resemblances that people always insisted on finding, and on which his enemies maliciously tried to fix attention, in order to do him an injury with certain persons of whom he had never thought. And indeed, I think he is right." For why, pray, should you apply all his actions and words, and seek to draw him into quarrels by publicly declaring that he is showing up so-and-so, when the facts are such as will fit a hundred people? As the business of comedy is to represent in a general way all the faults of men, and especially of the men of our day, it is impossible for Moliere to create any character not to be met with in the world. And if he must be accused of thinking of every one in whom are to be found the faults which he delineates, he must, of course, give up writing comedies. Upon my word, Chevalier, you wish to justify Moliere and spare our friend here. Not at all. It is you he spares, and we shall find another umpire. So be it. But tell me, Chevalier, do you not think that Moliere is exhausted by this time, and that he will find no more subjects for? No more subjects? Ah, dear Marquis, we shall always go on providing him with plenty, and we are scarcely taking the course to grow wise, for all that he can do or say. Stay, you must be more emphatic with this passage. Just listen to me for a moment. And that he will find no more subjects for... No more subjects? Ah, oh, dear Marquis, we shall always go on providing him with plenty. And we are scarcely taking the course to grow wise for all that he can do or say. Do you imagine that he has exhausted in his comedies all the follies of men? And without leaving the court, are there not a score of characters which he has not yet touched upon? For instance, has he not those who profess the greatest friendship possible? and who, when they turn their backs, think it a piece of gallantry to tear each other to pieces? Has he not those unmitigated sycophants, those vapid flatterers who never give a pinch of salt with their praises, and whose flatteries have a sickly sweetness which nauseate those who hear them? Has he not the craven courtiers of favourites, the treacherous worshippers of fortune, who praise you in prosperity and run you down in adversity? Has he not those who are always discontented with the court, those useless hangers-on, those troublesome, officious creatures, those people who can count up no services except importunities, and who expect to be rewarded for having laid a ten years' siege to the king? Has he not those who fawn 
on all the world alike, who hand their civilities from left to right, who run after all whom they see, with the same salutations and the same professions of friendship? Sir, you are most obedient. Sir, I am entirely at your service. Consider me wholly yours, dear sir. Reckon me, sir, as the warmest of your friends. Sir, I am enchanted to embrace you. Ah, sir, I did not see you. Oblige me by making use of me. Be assured I am wholly yours. You are the one man in the world whom I most esteem. There is no one whom I honour like you. I entreat you to believe it. I beg of you not to doubt it. Your servant. Your humble slave. Oh, Marquis, Marquis, Moliere will always have more subjects than he needs, and all that he has aimed at as yet is but a trifle to the treasure which is within his reach. That is something of the style in which it should be played. It is sufficient. Go on. Here are Clement and Eliza. Moliere to Mademoiselles de Pac and Moliere. Hereupon you two are to come up. To Mademoiselle de Pac. Be sure you to attitudinize well, and observe a good many formalities. That will constrain you a little, but it cannot be helped. One must sometimes do violence to oneself. Madam, I easily recognized you a long way off, and perceived from your bearing that it could be no other than you. You see, I have come to wait for a man with whom I have a little matter of business. That is just my case. Ladies, these boxes will serve you for armchairs. Come, madame, I beg you to be seated. After you, madame. Uh, good. After these little dumb shows, let each take a seat and speak sitting, whilst the marquise must sometimes get up and sometimes sit down again, in accordance with their natural restlessness. Steth, chevalier, you ought to physic your rolls. How so? They look ill. I salute your punstership. Heavens, madam, I do think your complexion dazzling white, and your lips of a marvellous flame colour. Ah, oh, what is it that you say, madam? Do not look at me. I am frightfully ugly today. Do, madam, just raise your hood. Fie! I am frightful, I tell you, and shock even myself. You are so lovely. No, no. Show yourself. Oh, pray do not. Please do. Heavens, no. Yes, do. How troublesome you are. Just for an instant. Ah. <sighs> You positively shall show yourself. We cannot do without seeing you. Good gracious, what an odd creature you are. What you wish, you wish so desperately. Ah, oh, madam, I am sure you need not dread the broad daylight. How wicked people are to say that you use any paint. I shall certainly be able to contradict them now. Lack a day, I do not so much as know what you mean by using paint. But where are those ladies going? Permit us, ladies, to give you in passing the most agreeable news conceivable. Here is Mr. Lycidas, who has just told us that someone has made a play against Moliere, which the Grand Company are going to act. It is true they wished to read it to me. A certain Br 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 Rousseau has written it. Sir... It is advertised under the name of Boursault, but to let you into the secret, many people have contributed to this piece, and one is disposed to form pretty high expectations of it. Since all authors and actors look on Moliere as their greatest enemy, we all unite against him to do him an ill turn each of us has added a stroke to his portrait but we have taken good care not to put our names to it it would have been too much honour for him to succumb before the eyes of the world 
to the efforts of a combined Parnassus. And so, to make his discomfiture more ignominious, we thought of picking out on purpose an author without repute. For my part, I confess that I am greatly rejoiced at it. And so am I. Gad, the mocker shall be mocked. Upon my word, he shall have a rap over the knuckles. That will teach him to satirize everybody. What? This impertinent fellow will have it that women have no wit. He condemns all our lofty modes of expression and makes out that we are always speaking in a humdrum way. Speech matters nothing, but he blames all our intimacies, however harmless they may be. And according to him, it is criminal to possess merit. It is unbearable. Women can do nothing henceforth. Why cannot he let our husbands be at peace without opening their eyes and making them notice things of which they never thought? All this is a trifle, but he satirizes even virtuous women. The wicked buffoon styles them respectable she-devils. He is an impertinent wretch. He deserves all he gets. This play, madame, must needs be supported and the comedians of the hotel oh let them have no fear i will lay my life on the success of this piece you are right madam too many people are interested in thinking it good you may judge whether all those who believe themselves to have been satirized by moliere will not take the opportunity of avenging themselves on him by applauding this comedy Recourt, ironically. No doubt, and for my part I can answer for a dozen marquises, six parisiers, a score of coquettes, and thirty victimized husbands who will not fail to applaud. Exactly so. Why should he go and offend all these people, and especially the victimized husbands, who are the best people in the world? Gad! I have been told that they will have a rub both at him and at all his plays in fine style, and that actors and authors from great to small are deucedly savage against him. That just serves him right. Why does he write wicked pieces that all Paris goes to see, and in which he paints people so well that everybody knows himself? Why does he not make plays like those of Mr. Lycidas? He would have no one against him and all the authors would speak well of him. It is true that such plays do not draw large audiences, but on the other hand, they are always well written, nobody writes against them, and all who see them are desperately anxious to think them fine. It is true that I have the advantage of making no enemies, and that all my works are approved of by the learned. You are justified in being satisfied with yourself. That is worth more than all the applause of the public, and than all the money that Moliere's pieces may draw. What does it matter to you whether people come to see your plays, so long as they are praised by your professional friends? But when will the painter's portrait be acted? I do not know, but I intend to appear in the front seat and cry, this is something like a play. Gad, and I too. And so do I, as I hope to be saved. For my part, I shall show myself there as I ought, and I will answer for a round of applause which shall drown all adverse opinion. It is really the least we can do to assist with our approbation the avenger of our cause well said that is what we all must do assuredly undoubtedly no quarter to this mimic upon my word chevalier your moliere must hide his head who he i promise you marquis that he intends to take a seat upon the stage and laugh at the rest at the portrait they have drawn of him gad then he will laugh on the wrong side of his face come come 
Perchance you will find more cause for laughter than you think. I was shown the play, and as everything amusing in it was exactly taken from Moliere, the pleasure which this will afford will not be likely to offend him. For, as to the parts where they set themselves to blacken him, I am very much mistaken if this is applauded by any one. And as for all the people whom they have tried to set against him, of whom, it is said, he had drawn two faithful likenesses, not only is it in bad taste, but I never saw anything more ridiculous or worse done. I never yet thought that it was a reproach to a dramatic author to depict men too well. The actors told me they expected a rejoinder from him, and that— A rejoinder? Verily, I should think him a great fool if he took the trouble to reply to their invectives. Everyone knows well enough from what motives they must be acting, and the best answer which he can make them is a comedy which will succeed like all the others. This is the true plan of being avenged on them, and judging from what I know of their disposition, I am sure that a new play— which will take their audiences from them, will annoy them much more than all the satires which could be written against them individually. La Chevalier! Uh, let me interrupt the rehearsal for a moment. To Moliere. May I make a suggestion? If I had been you, I should have treated the thing in another way. Everyone expects a vigorous rejoinder from you, and after the way in which they tell me you have been treated in this comedy, you were justified in saying anything against the actors, and you ought not to spare one of them. I am annoyed to hear you speak thus. This is just the way with you ladies. You would have me fire up against them and follow their example by rushing into invectives and insults. A great deal of honour I should get from it, and a vast deal of vexation I should bring them, are they not quite prepared for that kind of thing? And when they were discussing whether they should play the painter's portrait for fear of a rejoinder, did not some of them say, let him abuse us as much as he likes, so long as we get money? Is not that the mark of a soul very sensitive to shame? And should I not be well avenged by giving them what they greatly long to receive? They complain strongly of three or four words you said of them in the school for wives criticized and the pretentious young ladies. It is true that these three or four words are very offensive, and they have great reason to quote them. Come, come, it is not that. The greatest harm I have done them is that I have been fortunate enough to please a little more than they would have liked. Their whole conduct since we came to Paris has too clearly shown what pricks them. But let them do what they will, all their efforts cannot disturb me. They criticize my plays, so much the better, and heaven forbid that I should ever do aught that pleased them. It would be a bad business for me. Still, there is not much pleasure in seeing one's works pulled to pieces. What does it matter to me? Have I not got from my comedy all that I wished, since it had the good fortune to please those lofty personages whom I specially aim at pleasing? Have I not cause to be content with my lot, and are not all their censures a little too late? Does that affect me now, pray? When they attack a piece which has been successful, do they not attack the judgment of those who praised it rather than the skill of him who wrote it? Upon my word, I should have had a hit at that little scribe, who is rash enough to write against people who do not trouble their heads about him. How silly you are. A fine subject for diversion, Monsieur Bourseau would be. I should like to know how he could be tricked out to make him amusing, and whether, if he were ridiculed on the stage, he would be fortunate enough to make anyone laugh. It would be too much honour for him to be represented before an august assembly. He would ask nothing better, and he attacks me wantonly in order to make himself known in any way. He is a man who has nothing to lose, and the actors have let him loose on me only in order to engage me in a foolish quarrel and turn me aside by this dodge from other works which I have on hand. And yet you are simple enough to fall into the trap but I shall make a public declaration on this point. I do not mean to make any reply to all their criticisms and counter-criticisms. 
Let them say all the evil they can of my pieces. I am quite willing. Let them take our leavings and turn them inside out like a coat, to bring them on their own stage, and try to profit by any pleasant thing they find in them, and by a little of my good fortune. I give them leave. They have need of it and I shall be happy to contribute to their necessities, provided they will be satisfied with what I can decently grant them. Courtesy must have its limits, and there are some things which can make neither spectators laugh, nor him of whom they are spoken. I gladly leave to them my works, my figure, my attitudes, my words, the tone of my voice, and my style of recitation, to make and say whatever they will of them, if they can snatch some profit from them. I have nothing to say against all this, and shall be delighted if this can please people. But whilst I give them all this, they must do me the favour to leave me the remainder, and not to touch on things of the nature of those upon which I hear they attack me in their comedies. This I shall politely request of the honourable gentleman who undertakes to write for them. And this is all the answer they shall have from me. But, in a word... But, in a word, you will drive me mad. Let us say no more of this. We amuse ourselves by talking when we ought to be rehearsing our comedy. Where were we? I do not remember. You were at the very place. Good heavens! What noise do I hear? Surely the king has come. I can plainly see we shall have no time to get through it. That is what comes of our gossiping. Oh, well, you must do the best you can with the rest. On my word, I am in such a fright. I shall never be able to play my part unless I rehearse it all. What? You will not be able to play your part? No. Nor I mine. No more shall I. Nor I. Nor I. Nor I. What on earth do you mean to do? Are you all mocking me? Scene 4. Bejot, La Thuriere, Moliere, Bricotte, Lagrange, Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Dupac, Mademoiselle Bejot, Mademoiselle de Brigue, Mademoiselle Moliere, Mademoiselle Du Crosset, Mademoiselle de Hervé. Bejot. Gentlemen, I come to inform you that the king has arrived and waits for you to begin. Ah, sir, you see me in a terrible strait. I am distracted as I speak to you. These ladies are frightened, and say they must rehearse their parts before commencing. We beg the favour of another moment. The king is kind, and he knows well that the piece has been done hurriedly. Scene 5. Lothariere, Moliere, Bricotte, Lagrange, Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Du Pac, Mademoiselle Béjar. Mademoiselle de Brie, Mademoiselle Moliere, Mademoiselle du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. Oh, pray try and recover yourselves. Take courage, I entreat you. You must go and excuse yourself. How can I excuse myself? Scene 6. A busybody, La Thorière, Moliere, Bricotte, Lagrange, du Crosset, Mademoiselle du Pac, Mademoiselle Béja, Mademoiselle du Brie, Mademoiselle Moliere, Mademoiselle du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. First busybody. Gentlemen, begin. At once, sir. I believe I shall go out of my mind over this precious business. Scene 7. A second busybody. La Thorière, Moliere, Bricotte, Lagrange, du Crosset, Mademoiselle du Pac, Mademoiselle Béjar, Mademoiselle du Brie, Mademoiselle Moliere, Mademoiselle du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. Second busybody. Gentlemen, begin. In a moment, sir. To his fellow actors. What? Would you have me affronted? Scene 8. A third busybody. La Thorière, Molière, Bricotte, Lagrange, du Crosset, Mademoiselle du Poc, Mademoiselle Béjotte, Mademoiselle du Brie. Mademoiselle Moliere, Mademoiselle Du Crosset, Mademoiselle Hervé. Third busybody. Gentlemen, begin. Yes, sir, that is what we are about to do. 
how officious these gentry are coming and bidding us begin when the king did not order them scene nine a fourth busybody la thorière moliere bricotte lagrange du crosset mademoiselle du parc mademoiselle beja mademoiselle du brie mademoiselle moliere mademoiselle de crosset mademoiselle Hervé. fourth busybody gentlemen begin it is done sir to his fellow actors what must i be covered with confusion scene ten bejot lothoria moliere bricot lagrange du crosset mademoiselle du parc mademoiselle bejot mademoiselle du brie mademoiselle moliere mademoiselle du crosset mademoiselle Hervé. sir you come to bid us begin but no gentlemen i come to say that the king has heard of the troubles you are in and that in the kindness which distinguishes him he defers your new comedy to another time and will be satisfied to-day with the first you can give him oh sir you give me new life the king bestows on us the greatest possible favour in giving us time for that which he desired we shall all go and thank him for the extreme goodness which he displays towards us end of the impromptu of versailles